It is December of 62 BC, and the Vestal Virgins, along with aristocratic women, held the secret and mysterious rites of the goddess Bona Dea at the Damus Publica, which was Caesar's official residence as Pontifex Maximus. But he had vacated the house so that his mother and wife could hold these rites. While these secret and sacred rites were being celebrated, there was an intruder a man by the name of Publius Clodius Pulcher had infiltrated the home. Some say it was because he was in love with Caesar's wife, Pompeia. Others, that he was intrigued by the mysterious Bonadea and wanted to know what went down during these secret rites. Clodius had shaved his face and assumed the dress and implements of a lute girl and went into the house, dressed as a young woman. The door was left open and a maid escorted him in. As the maid went on ahead to tell Pompeia, Caesar's wife, Clodius became impatient. Having stood there, he decided to wander, avoiding the lights. Then he was spotted. But his cover wasn't blown. Caesar's mother, Aurelia, approached him as was normal. But Clodius refused to speak. Aurelia grabbed Clodius and demanded he talk. Clodius replied that he was waiting for Pompeia's Abra, who was the maid that escorted him inside. His voice revealed his deception, and Aurelia screamed. Clodius took off, but the doors were sealed. The women and servants grabbed torches and scurried about the house. At last, Clodius was found, hiding in the maid's quarters. They interrogated him and found out that it was Clodius Pulker. Once they figured him out, they kicked him out of the house and told their husbands. The Senate convened and passed the Senatus Consultum, giving the matter to the Vestal Virgins and the College of Pontiffs. Sacrilege, they cried out. Clodius committed a sacrilege, a very serious crime in Rome. The Senate again then passed a senatus consultum and instructed the consuls to promulgate a bill to create a special court to investigate the crime. Clodius, fearing for himself, was making personal appeals to everyone in the Senate, as was his family as well, the Claudii Pulcheres, who was an ancient and powerful family. Pompey's man, consul Marcus Pupius Piso, was friends with Clodius and worked to reject his bill. However, there was opposition. Cato and Consul Marcus Valerius Masella rigorously championed the measure and shamed the senators who were inclined to drop their support for the bill. When it was finally time for a vote in the assembly, Piso and Clodius' allies spoke against the bill and were placed in key locations to intimidate the voters. Cato saw this and immediately jumped up to the platform and spoke against Piso, attacking him for going against the Senate. Cato was then joined by Artensius, Favonius, and many other influential senators. It was so bad that Piso had to dismiss the assembly and summon a meeting of the Senate. Cato's championing of religious traditions was so powerful that the Senate voted 400 to 15 that the consuls should go ahead with the bill. Clodius was lucky that one of his friends was a tribune because his friend vetoed the bill and maintained it until a new jury, one that was more corruptible, took over. When the trial began, Cicero absolutely destroyed Clodius' alibi that he was out of town for the festival. Cicero would then call upon Cato to testify. Although it was most likely that Cato didn't possess any evidence, Cicero probably called upon him to speak at the trial, hoping that Cato's moral authority would be enough. Clodius responded by attacking all those who opposed him, especially Cicero, by belittling the Vestal Virgin Fabia, sister to Cicero's wife Terentia. Cato responded aggressively towards Clodius, putting him to shame for attacking a Vestal Virgin. The evidence against Clodius was overwhelming and was enough to get him convicted. However, because of massive bribery by two unidentified Romans by the name of Calvus and Ananianus, he got off. Cato was seriously upset by Clodius' acquittal, and he was immensely disappointed that the jury abandoned moral principle for cash, and so Cato will bring forth a motion. The Senate will pass a senatus consultum to investigate the courts for bribery, and specifically to target wealthy non-senators, the equestrians, and a specific group of tribuni who sat on the juries. Now, before I continue, I want to explain the bigger picture of Cato's motion to target the equites. Equites were the wealthy class, Romans who were wealthy, but chose not to pursue a political career. The reason for this was because for an equite to become a senator, he would have to give up public contracts and engaging in overseas trade, which senators were forbidden to do, 
and many equites relied upon these for their wealth. Now, equestrians were vital for the operations of the state. Many senators who wanted to construct, let's say, uh, public works, would contract equestrians to get it done. While they weren't senators, their wealth and influence were vital for the stability of the Roman state and its government. Cicero saw this clearly. Since he was elected consul in 63, Cicero had pushed for harmony between the classes, as he believed this was the only way to keep the Roman Republic alive. He achieved this harmony when he unified them into a coalition against Catiline, but at this point the harmony was, for the moment, gone. In a letter written by Cicero to his best friend Atticus, an incredibly successful businessman, he writes, At Rome I find politics in a shaky condition. Everything is unsatisfactory and foreboding change. For I have no doubt you have been told that our friends, the Equites, are all but alienated from the Senate. Their first grievance was the promulgation of a bill on the authority of the Senate for the trial of such as had taken bribes for giving a verdict. Thus, I, in the maintenance of my steady policy, preserve to the best of my ability that harmony of the orders which was originally my joiner's work. Cato's bill angered the equestrians, and as a result weakened the authority and influence of the Senate. Though the bill was never passed, the damage was done, and not only did this weaken the Senate, but also would cost Cato support from those outside of the Senate. By the end of 60 BC, the Senate had gone through a major change in leadership. Lucilius, the man who fought Mithridates in the east, and fought to have his triumph, which Pompey tried to block, and Hortensius, one of Rome's leading orators, had pretty much retired. Metellus Pius died in 63, and Catullus, Solanus, and Cato's uncle Mamercus all died before May of 60 BC. Plutarch will even say that Lucellus, who never really should have retired as he was one of the foremost optimates, thought that Cato was going to take control over conservative leadership and will even support him in that regard. Remember, the number of consulares was low and new leaders would have to take their place. Cicero would have been one of the best choices to assume the leadership of the Senate, as he was very influential and held the consulship, but Cato will surpass him in influence amongst the Senate due to Cicero being a new man. Cato was from a distinguished family that produced consuls, and this was one of the decisive factors for Cato, despite being an ex-tribune, and in theory shouldn't have ranked higher or close to Cicero. But like I've said, due to the small number of consulares, and the destruction of the Senate during the Social War and Civil War, there were not enough consulares to exert its authority over the, the other senators. Now, before I continue, allow me to rewind back to the end of 62 BC. Caesar had just left for Spain, and in the following February, Pompey Magnus had returned from the east. Pompey Magnus will immediately divorce his wife, Musia, half-sister of his former legate, Metellus Napos, who failed as a tribune and caused the riots. There's two reasons why Pompey Magnus divorced Musia, and that's because politically, he most likely wanted to distance himself from Napos, and second, Musia was kind of getting around, as it was said she carried on relationships with other men while Pompey Magnus was away. Now, to everyone's surprise, Pompey Magnus will immediately, after divorcing his wife, ask Cato to marry one of his nieces, a daughter of Servilia and Salanus, and then he asks Cato if another one of his nieces will marry Pompey's eldest son. This right here shows just how influential Cato was despite being a lowly ex-tribune. The most powerful man in Rome had just asked Cato, who had publicly declared to be an enemy of Pompey and also fought against Pompey, if he could marry one of Cato's nieces. This move on Pompey's end was to mend the rift that was torn between him and the Optimus senators, to reconcile and also to control Cato by, through a marriage alliance, prevent him from going against him. Now, who wouldn't want to be with Pompey Magnus? I know Cato's nieces wanted it. They were excited to marry Pompey and his son, but Cato, with no time at all, will refuse Pompey's offer. He did this because Cato did not want to limit himself and what he could do in politics. He also did this because Pompey had a record of going against the Senate, and he also killed some of Cato's family members in the past. He was very problematic back in the day, and Cato, who most likely thought of the best interests of the Republic, had probably marked Pompey as someone who had to go entirely. Someone to be destroyed politically. This was a grave mistake, and it will have long-term consequences that Cato will pay for. This decision left Pompey exposed, 
the Mitelli clan, powerful and noble, were now out to get Pompey. Not only that, but Cato had effectively driven a wedge between Pompey and the Senate like he had done with Caesar. Pompey had sent Napos to push his interests as tribune in 62, but Cato prevented Napos from doing anything, causing Napos from abandoning the tribunate. Then Pompey sent Marcus Pupius Piso and was able to get him elected consul for 61 BC, but Piso was caught and held down by the Bonadea affair. And so Pompey failed to get anything done, and now he has returned to Rome, having promised tens of thousands of Roman soldiers their allotment of land, and Cato had refused his offer of forming a marriage alliance. This refusal would cause Pompey to look elsewhere for an alliance, and thus he will marry Caesar's daughter, Julia. In July of 61, he pushed to get his legate Lucius Afranius elected consul for 60. Afranius was not a good politician. He lacked the talent for politics and was not well respected by the Senate. And as a result, was not a good choice to handle the situation of granting land to Pompey's soldiers. But before I continue, I want to explain briefly the situation with granting land to soldiers. The Senate for the most part always opposed granting land to soldiers and that is because it was expensive for them to do so. It cost the state a lot of money and also would have endangered Roman landowners with dispossession. And it also reinforced the system of loyalty from the soldiers to the generals, who if they granted them land would vote for them for life pretty much. Not only that, but the Roman soldiers themselves who were granted land would for the most part become homeless within a decade or if not homeless, deeply in debt. Going back now to where I left off, Pompey's decision to choose Afranius may demonstrate Pompey's lack of understanding of how much the political environment had changed while he was away. Pompey began spending money generously on bribing voters, and there was even a rumor Piso was organizing groups of agents in his house to distribute bribes. This rumor will cause Cato and Domitius Ahenobarbus to pass two senatorial decrees, the first one made it illegal for a candidate to have divisores or the agents in their homes, and a second allowing candidates' houses to be searched. As these two decrees were being passed, the tribune Alphidius Lurco proposed a bill to punish bribery. Those who promised money to voters but failed to pay were exempt from punishment, but anyone who was caught distributing bribes to voters would have to pay 3,000 sesterci to each tribe annually for life. Lurco received some sort of exemption from the Lex Aelia and the Lex Fufia laws regulating the timing of the promulgation of bills in order to bring this bill forward, which indicates that he had significant support in the Senate. What the nature of this exemption was is unclear. Lurco's bill shows some sort of concerted effort between him and Cato to prevent Pompey from supporting Afranius. Cato's bill will pass in the Senate, but the Popular Assembly will refuse to approve it because they were the ones who were benefiting from the bribery. This would have angered Cato greatly, as he seriously hated bribery, as it undermined the authority of the Senate and was unjust. But Cicero, as well as a few other senators, most likely argued against the bills in public, as the bills would have conflicted with the Lex Tullia that Cicero had promulgated as consul, and Lurco's bill would have clogged up the courts with false accusations. As a result, Pompey bribed his way and secured Afranius' election for consul in 60 BC. But not all was lost for Cato, as the other consul elected for 60 was Quintus Caecilius Metellus Keller, the half-brother of Pompey's former wife, Musia. Unlike his brother Metellus Napos, Metellus Keller was firmly aligned with the Optimates, and he was very upset over the Pompey divorcing Musia, and so Keller will block all actions that Afranius and others initiated on Pompey's behalf. The political battleground began straight away in the month of January. Pompey's lieutenant, Tribune Lucius Flavius, proposed an agrarian law that would provide the necessary land for distribution to veterans. Cicero was open for discussion on this bill. He wanted it to make sure that the property rights of private citizens were protected because as the bill stood, it didn't protect their rights. But this wouldn't go anywhere as Cato and Keller formed a powerful coalition and even Lucellus would come out of retirement to oppose Pompey's ratification of his Eastern Acts and possibly even join Cato and Keller's coalition. Cato will have convinced a good number of senators to back him and as a result of his obstruction, Lucius Flavius ordered Keller to be thrown in jail. But this backfired when a good many senators continue attending on the consul in his jail cell. 
Flavius will try to stop this by placing his bench in front of the door because tribunes were sacrosanct and could not be touched, but Keller responded by ordering his supporters to smash a hole in the prison. This situation was an embarrassment for Pompey, and he ordered Flavius to release Keller. Flavius then threatened to take the bill directly to the people, but Pompey was so badly shaken by the fierce opposition and thought that the popularity of the people would not be enough to overcome Cato and Keller's opposition, and so Pompey took a dramatic setback. For the first time, Pompey had met serious opposition from the Senate. He was used to getting everything he wanted from them, but Cato changed that and led the Senate into a successful coalition and blocked Pompey's legislation. But this was not the end of it. Cato and Keller were already working to prevent Pompey's efforts to acquire land for his veterans, and also Cato was working alongside other optimates to prolong the official ratification of Pompey's political and financial acts in the East. The opposition will become so fierce for Pompey that Atticus, Cicero's best friend, will caution Cicero about being too friendly with Pompey. Pompey was not the only one feeling the new pressure from the Senate. Crassus had also encountered resistance. When he was censor in 65, his efforts to advance his influence and reputation was thwarted by Catalyst. And if you remember from my video on the Catalan Conspiracy, this was to enfranchise the inhabitants of Transpadane Gaul and to annex Egypt. Crassus was a very wealthy businessman. He was consul in 70 BC and achieved great wealth and influence as lieutenant under Sulla and he came from a noble family and was seen as the champion of the equestrian class. So now let's talk about Crassus during this time. What happened with Crassus was he was encountering for several months trouble from the Senate on getting to act on business he brought before it. Now during this time, Crassus may have been helping Cato and his allies in trying to stop Pompey, but this is argued among scholars. But if he was helping Cato, it was to curry favor with the Senate, which wasn't working. Crassus's problem was with the provincial tax contracts. The Roman state would hold auctions for the collection of provincial taxes, so the wealthy equestrians would form into companies called the Publicani and would bid for the right to tax the province up for auction, and the highest bidder would then go off to that province and would collect more money than they bid. Well, for the East, it was a lot of money to bid, but what they did not account for was that for over a decade of warfare, the economy and the cities were in ruin. So not only did they lose all that money they bid because there was no money to collect, they probably could not rebound from the loss of their initial investments. Well, the Publicani wanted to renegotiate their contracts and so went to Crassus for help. And this is because Crassus probably invested in these companies. Crassus, now being the spokesman for the Publicani, went to Cicero for help. Cicero will agree to help, but personally, he believed that the Publicani should pay what they owe and that it was disgraceful to even demand their contracts be annulled. But Cicero felt that to reject the wealthy class would alienate them from the Senate, and we know how important the equestrians are. He felt this way because Cato had already done harm to the relationship between the Senate and the Equites. On the first day of December 61, Cicero and Crassus raised the issue to the Senate to renegotiate the contracts. The Senate agreed until it was the consul-elect Metellus Kellis' turn to speak, and he opposed the bill. Cato wanted to speak as well, but the day was over. For weeks, Cato will oppose the proposal and obstruct any attempt to allow changes to the contract. Cato either did not care or did not see that alienating the Publicani would undermine the Senate, which depended upon the equestrians for the maintenance of the Senate's authority. Cicero will write to Atticus saying, the one man who cares for the Republic with more resolution and integrity, it seems to me, than judgment or intelligence, is Cato. He has now been over two months tormenting the unfortunate tax farmers, who were his devoted friends, and won't let the Senate give them an answer, so we are unable to pass any decrees on other matters until the tax farmers are given their answer. Cato's ruthlessness will not end here. Later in the year, he will support a proposal by Publius Servilius Istaricus, that a clause be inserted into the Senatus Consultum denying official recognition of debts to Roman citizens incurred by free communities. This targeted wealthy moneylenders and will leave many Romans who had already lent money in the lurch. Not only that, but it will force Crassus into a corner, who had been the advocate for these equites. And I would like to remind you here that Cato's ruthlessness is actually untraditional and goes against Rome's long history of compromise. And now Cato has backed Pompey and Crassus into a position where they will actually lose influence and power by failing to carry out their promises. 
Cato's success at blocking Pompey and Crassus was incredibly successful and the Senate will support him. Cicero will complain to Atticus that no one in the Senate will follow his moderate approach. This does not mean that the Senate completely backed Cato, but it means that the Senate allowed Cato to continue most likely because they wanted to curb the power of Pompey and Crassus. This really frustrated Cicero, seeing Cato's uncompromising approach, alienating the wealthy class, as well as his uncompromising approach towards Pompey and Crassus. And now this brings us back to the quote in the beginning of this video. Cicero writes, As for our friend Cato, I have as warm a regard for him as you. The fact remains that with all his patriotism and integrity, he is sometimes a political liability. He speaks in the Senate as though he were living in Plato's Republic instead of Romulus' cesspool. What could be fairer than the jurors who take bribes should be brought to trial? Cato moved accordingly and the Senate agreed. Result, the knights declare war upon the house. Not upon me, for I was against it. Could anything be more shameless than tax farmers repudiating their contract? All the same, the loss was worth standing to keep the order on our side. Cato opposed and carried his point. Cato's influence would continue to grow. Sometime between the year 63 and 60 BC, Cato will have divorced his wife Attilia on the grounds that she had been unfaithful. Their two children will live with Cato and Cato will remarry shortly around 60 or 59 BC to Marcia, the daughter of Lucius Marcius Philippus, who will become consul in 56. And together they will have three children, one boy and probably two girls. Marcia belonged to the Marcii Philippi family, which was a very noble and ancient family that traced its roots to the fourth king of Rome, Ancus Marcius. Marcius' father was a praetor in 62, the same year Cato was tribune, and Marcius' grandfather had been consul in 91 and censor in 86. While Cato received support from the Marcii Philippi family, it wasn't exclusive, as Cato's new father-in-law, Marcius, will take Julius Caesar's niece, Atia, Octavius's, or better known as Augustus's, mother, most likely in the year 57. These marriages showcase, as I've already talked about, the interpersonal relationships between members of the Senate and how each member can simultaneously be part of multiple factions. To continue, in the year 60, Caesar finally returned to Rome in the month of June from his governorship in Spain. Cato was probably excited with the success against Pompey and Crassus and was ready to face Caesar. Caesar will be immediately presented with a problem. He was granted his right to hold a triumph, however, he would not have enough time to prepare for it because if he planned on running for the consulship, which in 59 would be the first year he is eligible, he would have to make his announcement in person, which would mean that he would have to give up his imperium or his military authority, which in turn will give up his right to a triumph. Caesar was stuck. He either holds his triumph and abandons the consulship for his first year, or he abandons his triumph and runs for the consulship. Caesar, however, attempted to ask the Senate for a one-time exemption so that he could have both his triumph and run for the consulship. Now, this was not the first time a commander had been exempted from a law, and from Caesar's position, this request was quite reasonable and the majority of the Senate agreed and wanted to grant the exemption because this was a good way to bolster stability within the Senate. But Cato will be against this, and he will go into a long filibuster, forcing the Senate not to make a decision. Many of the Senate must have been annoyed by this, because they most likely saw Cato's filibustering against Caesar as a personal feud, but this will cause Caesar to either give up the consulship or his triumph. Now, a triumph is the greatest honor a Roman can achieve. Lucellus waited outside of Rome for three years before receiving his, but Caesar was a different man. He forfeited his triumph and marched into Rome, and this was probably seen as a shock. To Cato, it most definitely was, and he will see this as a sign of Caesar's great ambition, which will embolden Cato into trying to stop him at all costs. Cato knew that he wouldn't be able to stop Caesar from obtaining his consulship, but he did succeed in getting the Senate to announce the provinces in which the consuls will be governing once their term is over, and these provinces will be the woodlands and paths of Italy. These commands would give no military glory and was an attempt by Cato and his allies to dissuade Caesar. Cato will also have his son-in-law Marcus Calpurnius Bibulus, a man who was close to Cato and also had a feud with Caesar, run for the consulship. So if Fabulus wins, he can block all of Caesar's acts. Caesar will form an alliance with a wealthy but little-known senator, Lucius Lucius, 
who would contribute in distributing bribes. Caesar and Lucius will dominate the scene, distributing bribes on such an unprecedented scale that Cato and his allies will be alarmed and would have to pool their money together to match Caesar's bribes. Yes, even Cato, the man who betrayed himself as the embodiment of Roman virtue and tradition and who was so against bribery, was bribing the election in favor of Abulus. No doubt he told himself that this was a moral good because it was to defeat Caesar, and Bibulus was a family member, so Cato was looking out for his family, right? I mean, family was a core value to Roman tradition. It could also be that Cato was driven out of hatred towards Caesar to stop him at all costs, foregoing his values and virtues. As a result of this massive bribery, both Caesar and Bibulus will win the election, there is something that I want you guys to know, and this is the start of something hidden in the background. While Cato may have had a personal feud with Caesar, it does not explain the rationale for the other senators who were allied with Cato. Caesar at this point is no different than any other ambitious Roman aristocrat, and while he used popularist tactics, it was hardly a reason to attack him so ruthlessly. Not only that, but the majority of the Senate did not see Caesar as a threat and were willing to grant him favors. What you are seeing, most likely, is Cato's influence gathering young Roman senators. Remember, many of the old consulares who held major influence were either dead or semi-retired, and Cato embodied Roman tradition, and most likely were attracted to him and wanted to be like him. This will become much worse towards the end of Cato's life, so, because of the Cato's ruthlessness, any chance that the Senate could have won over Caesar was gone, and there were senators who wanted to bring Caesar into the Optimus Circle. Cicero was one of them. In fact, Cicero will even write to Atticus about bringing Caesar over to the Optimates. Cicero wanted to bring both Pompey and Caesar into the Optimus Circle, but Cato's efforts were seriously preventing Cicero from being able to achieve this. After the months of July and August of 60, Caesar had several months to think about his situation. He would try to help the Publicani by speaking on their behalf in the Senate, but Cato would go into a long filibuster to prevent the Senate from doing anything. Caesar was probably very worried that his year as consul would be ruined by Bibulus and Cato. Caesar, backed into a corner, will around this time bring Pompey and Crassus together into what is called the First Triumvirate. This is debatable, as many primary sources will date the formation of the first triumvirate before Caesar's election and after, but according to what I've read in my secondary sources, it was most likely a gradual change. To cement the alliance between Caesar and Pompey, Pompey will marry Caesar's charming daughter, Julia. Caesar will try to get Cicero to join as well by sending his friend Balbus to ask Cicero to help Caesar, but Cicero will decline. Plutarch, along with many others, will say that it was at this moment that started the downfall of the Republic. However, at this point, Cato does not know that the First Triumvirate is a thing yet. When Caesar became consul, he gave a speech and told the Senate that he was willing to put the past behind him and that he would propose no measure that would go against the Senate. And his first act would be to create something like a notice board and would have the Senate publish for each meeting what they were discussing so that the public would know. And this was probably done so that if Cato or Babulus would oppose Caesar, they would look bad. The next act Caesar proposed was the Lex Agraria, a bill that would make public land and whatever private land that was voluntarily offered for sale, available to poor citizens as well as to Pompey's veterans. Caesar apparently worked hard on this bill, studying the past attempts to get a land bill passed and approved upon it. Caesar also went to the Senate, allowing the bill to be open for discussion, as well as Caesar promised to accept all reasonable requests for changes. Caesar handled this bill so well, traditionally speaking, that Cato and his allies could not find a single thing wrong with it, and now put him in an awkward position because now not only could Cato not justify opposing it, but he will oppose it anyway. Plutarch will say the reason is because Cato did not want Caesar or Pompey to reap the rewards for passing a successful land bill, which would make them popular amongst the people. When Cato was allowed to speak on the bill, he could not offer any improvements to the bill, but instead will say that there was no need to change anything, and so opposed it. Now, this again reflects Cato's obstructionism, when Rome had had a long tradition of compromise to the point of actually looking more of a popularist tactic than an optimate. 
For the month of January, Cato will oppose the bill by filibustering. Cato's defiance against Caesar's display of reasonableness has some scholars believing that Cato was deliberately trying to provoke Caesar because Cato believed Caesar was faking it and he wanted Caesar to drop his guard and display his inner tyrant, so to speak. Well, it worked, and Caesar lost his patience, threatening to throw Cato in jail. Well, as soon as Caesar said this, Cato jumped on the offer and willingly went to jail. A great number of senators will accompany Cato, and when Caesar accosted a senator, telling him that he was leaving before the Senate was dismissed, the senator replied saying that he would rather be in jail with Cato than here with Caesar, and this surprised Caesar, taking him off guard. Cato successfully was able to push the Senate into thinking Caesar was a tyrant, and his opposition worked. Caesar will realize his mistake and will release Cato from jail before the matter became worse. Caesar will have no choice but to use popularist tactics, and he will take this bill directly to the popular assembly. Caesar prepared ahead of time by having Pompey summon all of his veterans to Rome to bolster the number of voters in favor of his bill. When Caesar presented the bill to the people, he asked his consular colleague Bibulus if he could find anything wrong with the bill, and if he thought anything needed to be changed. Knowing that the Optimus could not find anything wrong, Bibulus will say that the bill was a change to tradition. Caesar will play upon this. Knowing that Bibulus was looking bad in front of the people, Caesar will beg Bibulus to change his mind and help the people, but Bibulus will continue to oppose it and even shout in anger that the bill will not be passed this year, even if the Roman people wanted it. Caesar was able to reverse the situation and display in front of everyone Cato and Babulus' senselessness about the opposition of the bill. And so Caesar will avoid calling upon magistrates and instead call upon Pompey and Crassus to give their voice to the bill. And this was the first official unveiling of the first triumvirate. And the Senate and Cato were shocked. And that is where I will end the video here. Thank you for watching. But before I continue, I would like to personally thank a subscriber by the name of Sapientisat for a generous donation to the channel. It was very kind of him. If you've enjoyed Cato the Younger Part 3, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Feel free also to check out some of my other videos. Thank you.